Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 194 of our Bible study review. Today, we're opening up a new book, the book of Zechariah, and we're going through chapters one through four. Now, this book is to be read in conjunction with the book of Haggai. Now, think about it. The word of Yahuwah came to the same generation, the post-exilic generation, through Haggai in the second year of King Darius during the sixth month the seventh month, and then the ninth month. So we see the word of Zechariah comes in the eighth month, and this is a call to repentance. Let's open up and start reading from verse two. It says, Yahuwah was very angry with your fathers. So you will say to them, thus says Yahuwah of hosts, return to me and I will return to you, says Yahuwah of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried. Thus says Yahuwah of hosts, Turn away from your evil ways and deeds. But they did not listen or pay attention to me, says Yahuwah. So where are your fathers? And do the prophets live forever? This is a question he's asking the people. He says, are your rebellious forefathers here now? And he says, do the prophets live on forever to keep telling you to repent and return back to me? He says, surely my words and statutes that I commanded to my servants, the prophets, did they not persuade your fathers, right? And the majority, the answer is no, they weren't persuaded. And so he says, they turned back and said, whatever Yahuwah of hosts planned to do to us according to your ways and deeds, so he has done to us. And he is telling this generation, look, the reason why you went into the Babylonian exile is because of your forefathers falling away. And so we see that the word of Yahuwah is coming in the eighth month and he's telling them to repent, to repent from idol worship, to repent from this apathetic attitude towards their God. So if you fit the pieces of the puzzle together from reading Haggai yesterday, the sixth month, the seventh month, and then the eighth month is right here. And then go back to Haggai chapter two, verse 10, and you will see that the word of Yahweh comes to them in the ninth month. And you will see how he is trying to stir his people up, not just the general population, but the priesthood as well. Now the word of Yahuwah keeps coming towards his people because he wants to win encourage them to continue to restore and rebuild. This is not just going to happen at the snap of the father's fingers. He wants his people to be involved in this, but they do have opposition in the building process. And we will read about that once we get to the book of Ezra. But the people of Judah were extremely discouraged. So the word of Yahuwah kept coming forth to encourage his people to build them up so that they would be strong and not fear the opposition. As we pick up reading in verse 7, we will see that Zechariah starts to have this series of visions from Yahuwah. So let's start reading. And it says, On the 24th day in the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, not to be confused with Shabbat. The month is called Shabbat, okay? Now we know what the 11th month is called in Hebrew. And it says, During the second year of Darius, the word of Yahuwah came to the prophet Zechariah, and it says, I saw during the night a man riding on a red horse, but he was standing among the myrtle trees that were in the ravine, and behind him were red sorrel and white horses. And I said, What are these, my lord? And the angel who was speaking with me said, I will show you what these are. Then the man who was standing among the myrtle trees responded and said, these are the ones whom Yahuwah has sent out to walk to and fro on the earth. They answered and said to the angel of Yahuwah, who was standing among the myrtle trees, we have gone to and fro on the earth and the earth is resting and peaceful. Now, many Bible scholars and students of the word believe that this angel of Yahuwah is actually Messiah pre-incarnate. And so we also need to know that the horsemen represent angelic beings who are watching over the work of Yahuwah. Now we know that Satan, right? He goes to and fro and he's trying to see who he can steal, kill, and destroy from. But we also know that Yahuwah looks over his plans. And so these are angelic beings going across the earth to make sure that the word of Yahuwah and the plans of Yahuwah are being fulfilled. Let's pick up in verse 12. It says, Then the angel of Yahuwah said, How much longer, O Yahuwah of hosts, will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and the cities of Judah with which you have been angry these 70 years? So that was during the time of the Babylonian 
exile, right? And this is supposedly Messiah speaking to the Father. And it says, Yahuwah answered the angel speaking to me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said, cry out saying, thus says Yahuwah of hosts. So this is what he wants Zechariah to say. I have a great jealousy for Jerusalem and Zion. And I have a great anger for those nations who are at ease. For while I was angry, but a little, they helped to increase evil. So while Judah was in the Babylonian exile, the rest of the nations kept moving forward in their abomination and they increased evil in the earth. So we see that the wrath of Yahuwah is no longer on his people. Now it's towards the nations and he's ready to restore his people. Let's pick up in verse 16. It says, Therefore, thus says Yahuwah, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy, and my house will be built in it, says Yahuwah of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. And he says, Cry out again, thus says Yahuwah of hosts. Yet again, my cities will overflow with goodness, and again, Yahuwah will comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. So it's an ultimate word of encouragement. Although Yahuwah was angry with his own people because they broke the covenant, they fell away and they were committing abominations again and again and again. But now that they have paid for their penalties, right, for 70 years during the exile, now his mercy is upon his people while he says that his wrath is going out towards the other nations. He's letting this returning generation understand and know that so long as they stay in his will and do not behave like their forefathers, that his wrath will not be poured out on them. His wrath will be poured out on the nations for what they have done to them. And as we open up verse 18, we're going to see that Zechariah has another vision. So let's read about it. It says, and I then lifted up my eyes and I saw four horns. And I said to the angel speaking to me, what are these? And he answered, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now we know that Assyria did scatter Israel, but many believe that, of course, this is also talking about Babylon, Greece, and then later on, Rome. And when we read about horns in the Bible, we're reading about power and strength of different kingdoms. And this is what Yahuwah is saying. These four horns are the ones who have scattered my people. So let's pick up in verse 20. It says, then Yahuwah showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the four horns that scattered Judah, after which no one could raise his head. And these four craftsmen have come to terrify and throw down the horns of the nations who lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. And so these craftsmen are coming to see about those nations that scattered his nation. And the craftsmen may represent each nation that conquers another nation. We know that the Medes and the Persians overcame Babylon, right? King Darius is one of those Persians right now. We know that they were granted permission to go back to restore and rebuild their land through the Medes and the Persians. And as we read in the book of Daniel, after the Medes and the Persians come the Grecians, right? Alexander the Great, he was the one who came up after the Medes and the Persians, right? And he quickly started conquering the world. Now, Alexander the Great was actually recorded as being kind to the people of Judah. But after his death, there were four generals who rose up in the Grecian Empire, and one of those generals was extremely cruel to the people of Judah, Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a picture of the Antichrist. And then Rome would come to conquer the Grecian Empire, and all of these nations had their dealings in scattering Yah's people. Chapter 2 opens up with another vision. Let's read about it. I think it's going to make your heart jump for joy. It says, and I lifted up my eyes and I saw a man with a measuring cord in his hand. And I said, where are you going? And he responded to measure Jerusalem and to note what its width and its length are. And I just want to take you to a prophecy that matches this vision. So you'll have a revelation about what the next part of this vision has to say. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 49 and read verses 20 through 21. And it says, the children whom you shall have after you have lost 
the others shall say again in your ears, the place is too cramped for me. Make room for me that I may dwell here. Then you shall say in your heart, who bore these for me? Since I have lost my children and I am barren, a captive and a wanderer. And who brought these up? I was left alone. And from where did these come, right? So Zechariah is having a vision of an angel who is measuring Jerusalem and its borders, right? And this is actually a picture of Zion speaking, that she lost her children. And now she's gaining all these other children from all of these other nations. And she's like, where are you coming from? And we see that the angel in Zechariah is measuring this land because this land is going to have to stretch its borders to fit all of the children who come into Zion. Let's pick up in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 3. And it says, Then the angel who was speaking with me went out, and then another angel came out to meet him and said, Run, say to this young man, Jerusalem will be inhabited as villages without walls. Why? Because there'll be no borders. It needs to stretch its borders to fit all of the children of Yah who have come in through Messiah, all right? And it says, because of the multitude of men and animals in her. And it says, and I will be like a wall of fire around her, says Yahuwah, and I will be glory in her midst, right? There was only one time in history where there was peace on all sides for a very short period of time, and that was with King Solomon. But when King Yeshua comes, right, it says that Yahuwah is going to be a firewall around his People, there will be no need for any walls of protection because the protection of Yahuwah himself will be surrounding the city. And these are visions that are being shared with Zechariah to encourage the people to keep building up the kingdom. Verses 6 through 13 read as an appeal to the remaining exiles who have yet to return back to Jerusalem. Now remember, when Nebuchadnezzar came to take the Judeans to Babylon, he took them in waves. He did not take them all at once. And so they are returning in the same fashion. And Yahuwah is calling out to the remainder of those who have yet to return home. And this is what he says, up, up, Flee from the northern land, says Yahuwah, for I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says Yahuwah. Deliver yourself, O Zion, you who live with the daughter of Babylon. He's calling them home and he says, For thus says Yahuwah of hosts, He has sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eyes. For I will swing my hand against them and they will become plunder for their servants. Then you will know well that Yahuwah of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says Yahuwah. And many nations will join themselves with Yahuwah in that day, and they will be my people. I want to remind you who you are since you have been grafted into the family of Israel. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 48 and let's read about the descendants of of Ephraim or Ephraim, the one whom Jacob placed his right hand on and he adopted him as his own son, which is a picture of the father adopting us. Let's read about it here. In the middle of verse 19, it says, but truly his younger brother will be greater than he. And he's speaking about Manasseh because Manasseh was the firstborn, but he did not get the firstborn blessing. And as we know, the 10 northern tribes were called Israel, but they were also called Ephraim. And it says his descendants will become a multitude of nations. Now, depending on what Bible you have, nations translates as Gentiles. Now I want to take you to another part in scripture, which is in the book of Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Let's connect these dots. And these are the words of Paul or Shaul. Let's start in verse 25. For I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, lest you be wise in your own estimation. For a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the nations, a.k.a. Gentiles, has come in. And so all of Israel will be saved. Do you see what he is saying about those who are grafted in, those who come in 
through the nations, right? Those who are not natural born Israel, but they come into the family. They are grafted in. Do you see what this is saying? He says, so that all of Israel may be saved. Once you are in the covenant, you are no longer of the other nations. You are grafted into this covenant family. We need to understand that the new covenant is going to be cut with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It's not cut with anyone else. So you must be grafted in. Go back and read Jeremiah chapter 31 if you're having trouble with it. And if you still are having trouble with it, please watch the recommended video down below by 119 Ministries. Many of us grew up in churchianity and we have believed the lies of dispensationalism, which separates those who come through Messiah and the natural born children of Israel. And that's why there's so much confusion about who we are and what our identity is. Let's reread verse 11 in chapter two of Zechariah. It says, and many nations will join themselves with Yahuwah in that day, and they will be my people. Do you see that? No separation. And how do we join ourselves to Yahuwah? By way of his son. Yeshua is the door to the Father. There's no other way. All right, let's keep reading. And it says, And I will reside in your midst, and you will know that Yahuwah of hosts has sent me to you. And Yahuwah will possess Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and he will again choose Jerusalem. Be still, all flesh before Yahuwah, for he is stirred from his holy habitation. Chapter 3 opens up with another vision. Let's read about it. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, who is the high priest, standing before the angel of Yahuwah, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And Yahuwah said to Satan, Yahuwah rebuke you, Satan. And Yahuwah who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is this not a burning brand taken out of the fire? Now Joshua had on filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And he said to those standing before him, take off his filthy garments. Then he said, see that I have removed you from your iniquity and I will clothe you with rich robes. I hope that y'all are catching a vision as well because we see that Joshua is a high priest. Now Joshua's full Hebrew name is Yahoshua, which means salvation of Yah. It's no coincidence that Joshua is the high priest over Jerusalem at this time. Now the Bible scholars believe that the angel of Yahuwah is actually Yeshua, right? Or Yehoshua, our Messiah. And so we see that Satan is accusing the priest, right? Does he not accuse us, the priesthood now, right? And he sees Joshua with filthy garments on and he is stripped of those filthy garments and he is told that the iniquity is taken away from him. We also know that these are garments, right? And they are filthy because they are stained with sin. Our Messiah, when he blows that trumpet and calls up his body, right? He calls up his priesthood. We take off these filthy garments and he gives us clean garments and all iniquity is removed from us, right? Our new incorruptible bodies are the rich robes and we take off the filthy garment of the flesh as we enter in to the millennial reign. I hope you're seeing it. Let's continue reading in verse five. And I said, let them place a pure turban on his head. So they put a pure turban on his head and garments on him. And the angel of Yahuwah was standing by. And the angel of Yahuwah admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Yahuwah of hosts, if you walk in my ways and keep my charge, then I will judge my house and guard my courts, and I will give you access to those who are standing here. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. Hear this, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends sitting before you, for these men are a sign. I am bringing my servant, the branch, the stone that I have set before Joshua. On that single stone is seven eyes. All right. And so we know who that branch is. That is Yeshua HaMashiach, or his most ancient name is Yehoshua. If you need a connecting scripture, please go back and read Isaiah chapter 11. And so he sees this vision of a stone with seven 
eyes and he says, I will engrave an inscription, says Yahuwah of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in one day. All right. And so this may be pointing to the day of atonement, which I have spoken of several times. All right. As we walk through these prophets who, you know, speak of the day of Yahuwah, this future day of judgment, this is the day of atonement, I believe. But it could also be working in conjunction with the day that he writes the full Torah upon the tablet of our hearts. There wouldn't be any more iniquity in the land in that day as well. So just keep an open mind about what this may mean. Verse 10, it says, On that day, says Yahuwah of hosts, the day that he removes the iniquity from the land, he says, Each of you will invite your companion to come and sit under the vine and under the the fig tree. So this is a picture of them sitting back, maxing and relaxing and not worrying about any enemies coming to conquer them, right? Because Yahuwah is a firewall around the city. None is going to come and make them afraid ever again. And now let's finish out today's reading with chapter four, which opens up with another vision. And it says, and the angel who was speaking with me returned and woke me up like a man who was roused from his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I responded, I see a completely gold lamp stand and a bowl at its top with seven lights on it and seven pipes on it for each lamp in order to light them. And there are two olive trees next to it, one on the right side of the bowl and one on the left. So I answered and I asked the angel speaking to me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel speaking with me responded, do you really not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Verse six. And he said to me, this is the word of Yahuwah to Zerubbabel saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit says Yahuwah of hosts. All right. So I'm going to stop here and break this down a little bit. So Zechariah is seeing a vision of the menorah and he sees this oil flowing through it and two trees on the side and he doesn't understand what this means. And the angel was like, you really don't understand what this means? Now we know that the menorah points to the Messiah because he is the light of the world, but the oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Yahuwah is saying, it's not by your strength, not by your might, but by my power will your people, right? Will Zerubbabel and Joshua be empowered and be encouraged to stir up the people to do this work and building up the temple, right? And this restoration period, you won't be able to do it in your own strength. You'll only be able to do it by my power by my spirit, says Yahuwah. Let's continue reading. It says, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will be made level ground and he will bring out the top stone amidst shouting of grace, grace to the stone. The people have been discouraged in building up the temple and there's this great mountain in the way. And this great mountain represents the many obstacles standing in the way of the people rebuilding the second temple, right? This laid waste for like 20 years. And yes, they did have those who came in to oppose the work that they were doing. And we saw in the previous vision that Satan was coming against Joshua, the high priest. Satan was trying to stop this work. And we know that Satan works through people. He works through vessels to stop the work of Yahuwah from happening. And that's why the father was rebuking Satan himself. And so the top stone represents that when the temple is done, right? It's a great shout of grace and it will be done by the power of Yahuwah's spirit, right? If it is grace, then it is a gift from Yah and man cannot take credit for it. Again, not by power and not by might, but by the spirit of Yahuwah, will they be able to withstand the blows of the enemy? Let's pick up in verse eight. It says, then the word of Yahuwah came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have established the foundation of this house and they will even complete it. Then you will know that Yahuwah of hosts has sent me to all of you. So we see that the word of Yahuwah is speaking through Zechariah and he's saying, look, Zerubbabel, the governor, right? Who is also a picture 
of Messiah because he's the one responsible for laying the foundation of building the second temple. And he says, you're going to finish it too. And we know that our Messiah is called the author and finisher of our faith. What he started working in us, he is going to complete. He is going to sanctify and consecrate his priesthood during the millennial reign so much. He is going to perfect his work in us and he is going to bring to the Father a perfect sacrifice. That is us, his priesthood. I just want you to see scripture connecting all the way through and through. This is a story that is being told through this generation that would point to all of us in the future. All right, let's pick up in verse 10. It says, for who has despised the day of small things? These seven will rejoice and see the plumb line in the land of Zerubbabel. And so remember the seven eyes that we saw earlier, the seven eyes are watching the work, making sure that the word of Yahuwah is being complete in the earth. And he says, these are the eyes of Yahuwah, which survey and they go to and fro throughout the earth. His will it will be done regardless of who is trying to come against it. The word of Yah does not fall short or to the ground. All right, let's pick up in verse 11. It says, then I answered and I asked, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And I asked a second time, what are these two branches of olive oil that are next to the two golden pipes from which they pour out the gold oil? And he asked me, do you not know what these are? And I responded, no, my Lord. And he answered, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Adon of all of the earth. And so the two trees in this case are actually Zerubbabel and Joshua, right? The governor and the high priest, and they both point to our Messiah. But we will see that there are many pictures in the past where there have been many who have been anointed to do a special work in that time. For instance, Moses and Aaron. They were anointed to do a special work, right? To help, to assist, to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt and bring them into the wilderness that they may enter into covenant with Yahuwah. And we will also see this with Elijah and Elisha, right? And then we see the two witnesses at the very end of the book of Revelation. We always see these two anointed ones. But in this case, right, both Zerubbabel and Joshua point to our Messiah. Again, all of the kingdom government will be upon his shoulders and our Messiah is Melchizedek. He is the high priest and we are his priesthood. Please be encouraged by these visions and understand that Yahuwah has created you for such a time as this. He has anointed you to do a special work during this time as he did with many others in the past. Every word of Yahuwah will be complete no matter what, and it will be done by his spirit. We can do nothing in our own strength, but we can do all things through Christ, through the anointed one who strengthens us to do the special work which we are called to do, right? This Bible study is an example. Do you think that it's easy to do this every single day? It is not. But it's not by my power and it's not by my might. It's by his spirit that he has graced me to do this special work. So please be encouraged to answer the call that he has placed on your life. Deep and word family, that's all that I have for you today. Until tomorrow, Yah bless.